What is up guys, DT Ninja here to bring you my Rurouken Hokkaido Arc Chapter 8 review and discussion, the origins of Kenkaku Heki. Okay guys, the weaponized swordsmen, we finally get the origins, where they come from, who they actually are, their ambitions, and also there are more of them. So at the end we get a surprise, there are more members, and they're they're already attacking another prison. So that's very interesting. Uh, and I really am curious to see what these characters are and, you know, what maybe some, you know, backstory to them. So, but anyways, uh, before we get to that, I want to give you guys a new uh, update on me. Uh, so I've decided to put an archive on my Google Drive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the link in the description to chapter eight, this chapter, uh, for my Google Drive. So you'll be able to download the English translation that I did there instead of just looking at my Facebook. I'm also going to give you the link to Facebook if you want to look that up. Uh, but I've given an alternate link uh, just, you know, to make it easier for you guys to read. Um, I've also translated chapter 9, so I'm actually a chapter ahead uh, this is a month behind, by the way. Uh, so I will give the link in the description as well. So I will leave uh, those three links in the description so you guys can check those out. Um, back to the chapter. Notable things of the chapter. So uh, these notable things I just noticed, and they're very important. So the very beginning, there is the title scan with all of the characters uh, on a map, and it shows where they're located. It's very interesting how we have Kaoru and Kenji at Tamodo Studio, again with Mr. Tamodo, and also you have Kenkaku Heki on Mount Hakodate scoping out Kenshin, uh, you know, Sano's there with Kenshin, Byakuya is in the prison, so we're gonna get a confrontation there, you get, you know, the interrogation, and also you get Aran and Ashitaro who are looking for the uh, uh, Asahi, you know, the missing character, uh, and they're at um, Hachimanzaka Slope, so, and then we also get uh, the where Asahi actually is, so we the readers get an idea where she is actually located, even though the other characters don't know where she is, we get an idea of that, and I'm glad that Watsuki did that. That was very interesting. Okay, moving on. Byakuya and Kenshin's confrontation, their interrogation. Obviously, Kenshin uh, decides to go into the gate and meet Byakuya. Yakuya basically comes right to him. You know, he is still handcuffed, but he's, you know, very happy to see him. It's very creepy at the same time. He has this uh, very knowledgeable, he's very knowledgeable about Kenshin, which is very interesting. He knows everything about him. He knows that Sano is his best friend. He knows that he met, you know, Aoshi Shinomori. He fought him. He knows he fought Shishio. He knows about his vengeful... Uh, you know, brother-in-law Inishi, he knows about his master, Seijiro Hiko, so it's very interesting in that aspect, but it also, you know, just shows that he is, you know, this this very important character who, who seems to have a very uh, crazy idea for his group. So, Going back to Kinkaku Heki, uh, the Rurouken franchise has always been based off the Meiji era, you know, the Meiji Swordsman romantic tale, right? Uh, in this series, that has been the whole series for Kenshin. However, now we learn that the Kinkaku Heki are actually tracing back to the Kamakura era. So it's even further back than the Edo period, which is interesting to me. Very interesting. I did not expect this at all. Also, the Mongols are mentioned in this chapter. That is another interesting thing. We also get a history lesson from Eiji Mishima 
and the Mongols. That was very interesting that uh, they were mentioned. Obviously, the Kamakura period, the Mongols invaded Japan. So that was uh, interesting. Obviously, the Kamikaze uh, is the reason they survived. And obviously, the samurai are the uh, ancestors of Byakuya and the Kinkaku Heki. So very interesting stuff in this chapter. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I've actually been ill lately, so I'm uh, drinking out of my uh, Rurokin uh, teacup here. Um, so, uh, the next thing, uh, obviously uh, Byakuya is very knowledgeable not only about Kenshin, but he knows his stuff. Uh, he predicts the future. He predicts that uh, imperialism... Uh, will lead to a world war. He even says that this Russian power will grow and we will be forced to fight them. And he's obviously talking about the Russo-Japanese War, which happens in 1904. So we're going to get, you know, a progression of imperialism. And obviously it progresses and progresses and does lead to a world war. So it's interesting how the Kinkaku Heki actually are about keeping foreign powers out and he mentions that they are the trump card against all foreign powers so it's not just that they want to rule the land it's that they want to make sure that japan is secure and one of the most powerful it sounds like they want to rule the world to me uh but yeah uh they they want to be the ones you know controlling the powers rather than the others taking over them so but anyway, um, also he reveals uh, his motivations, how they want to, you know, make capable warriors. That's the reason they're building up these capable warriors, uh, you know, like Saito, you know, they want him to join, or Kenshin, they want him to join. So, very interesting stuff. Uh, also, Kabato Prison. Kabato Prison is introduced, uh, it's attacked. And we learn that the Kinkaku Heki are not only five men, there are several. So we have another group of the weaponized swordsmen attacking Kabato Prison, which is an actual real-life prison uh, that, that uh, Watsuki is bringing to life in his story. So very interesting stuff. Uh, yeah. So, let's get to the discussion questions. Question number one. Who are the Kinkaku Heki? They are the weaponized swordsmen. What is their goal? Their motivations? I kind of explained it a little bit. Their goal is to basically rule the world. They want to dominate the world, but they want Japan to be the best of the best. Because he wants, you know, Japan uh, to be the best, but he also wants to keep foreign powers out. He wants to uh, make sure that Japan is well protected, so he's wanting to recruit these capable warriors. And the reason he does this is obviously for victory. He doesn't want Japan to lose and be taken over in, you know, imperialism. Basically, they take over uh, another country, you become part of that country, so anyways or being ruled over by that country the mongols for example they were very good at this they ruled over the entire world at one point europe persia china and if they didn't rely on tradition they would have ruled over europe completely but their leader died and they went back to their home you know their homeland and they never returned so we are very fortunate that they relied on tradition but my point here is that uh, the Kinkaku Heki are obviously uh, they know about imperialism they understand imperialism and they're very much a warrior race they're samurai they're former samurai they're tracing back to the Kamakura samurai so they are all about keeping foreign powers out and the reason they do that and the idea of doing this is to pit people against each other and have battles experience in battle is the only way they can succeed against foreign powers because without experience they're going to lose okay uh, against the mongols uh, i mentioned this before but in the invasion of the mongols obviously attrition 
is the key, you know, the, the, the art of war, outlasting your opponent, even if you have a hundred samurai against, let's say, a thousand or ten thousand Mongols, as long as you have the right strategy and you outlast them, you can do it. However, the Mongols were very skilled, they took out many samurai, but it was when the Mongols decided to go by ship and use the water, that's when uh, you know, fate kind of came into play with the kamikaze, the huge tsunami. Obviously, you guys know Hokusai's painting. That is what we're talking about. Kamikaze basically saved, uh, you know, Japan from the Mongols. And that was really the only way they won uh, by outlasting their opponent by mere luck and outlasting, you know, enduring, you know, enduring the battle. So, but anyways, they, they tried it again, and obviously the same thing happened by ship. So, uh, the Mongols were very effective on horseback uh, with their bows and arrows. Their, they even had, you know, these explosives uh, from China. Obviously, they invaded China, so they had all these new technology that Japan didn't have. But it was when they were on the ships and they were, you know, in those rough waters when those uh those that that divine wind uh per se that tsunami came over and that's when japan you know was was effective against the mongols and that's what saved him that that's kind of the whole idea there but going back to them they want to make sure that experience will prepare them for the worst when these foreign powers come. So that's Kankaku Heki. That's what they are. Next question. How did Byakuya predict future battles with foreign powers? Well, he definitely understands imperialism, and that is another reason for his motivation of bringing in capable warriors. That's the reason he wants these mock battles, these experimental battles that you'll see in the upcoming chapters, because experience will bring victory. He says he must prevail against these foreign powers. And you'll see this, this wonderful, this amazing scan of Kenshin and him. They're basically yelling at each other. I had it colored, by the way, Chris JP20, as normal, my, my, my close friend, he uh, colored it. But yeah, you'll see it uh, where they're both really, really, uh, you know, showing their emotion there uh, towards this idea. Obviously, Byakuya is all for, you know, experiments uh, in battle, uh, putting these innocent people in battle, trying to make them into warriors. Uh, not, not necessarily innocent people, but we're talking about regular civilians, making civilians into warriors uh, by putting them in war, basically. That's the idea. And Kenshin's like, are you trying to make Hakudate into a battlefield? And he's like, it's already happened. What? makes you think that we are just five people and that comes with the next thing and can Kakuheki have more than just five members that was very interesting so that brings the next question what is important about kabato prison and who are the other mysterious members that are attacking from Kinkakuheki? they are the attack squad of Kabato prison uh, of the Kinkaku Heki. So very interesting. What is important about this prison? This prison is a real life prison uh, brought to life for, for uh, you know, Watsuki and his story. But what is important about it? Well, I'll tell you right now, there are some people that are in it. There are some prisoners that are very famous. There is one that was in the Shinsengumi. I'm not going to uh, spoil you, but there is a Shinsengumi former member that was stationed at that prison. So get ready to be surprised because the next chapter is going to be epic. Chapter 9, uh, I've already translated it. Like I said, I left you the link in the description so you guys can check it out. There's also going to be a familiar face returning. Uh, that's pretty much it.
Um, I have a prediction for chapter 9. I have a feeling that there is a very good chance that Anji, uh, the fallen monk, is at the Kabato prison. Now, I've already translated the chapter, so I know what happened, but that was my prediction before the chapter came out. And the reason is because it's being attacked. It's a prison. It's a famous prison. Uh, yeah, so that's my feeling. Also, I have a feeling there's another prisoner there that is very famous, and he will make an appearance. So, anyways, that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, we will get to find out more about the new, uh, the, the other Kinkaku Heki members. So, I hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you guys in the next one.